Hi, friends. Welcome, everyone. Hi, Chad. How are you doing today? Hi, John. I'm great. How are you? I'm awesome. I'd like to invite everyone and welcome everyone to this webinar where we will be talking about how to influence cotton and produce high quality, high yielding cotton and how to manage plant nutrition differently to produce a completely different outcome. I'm very glad to be here today with Chad Wall, who we've been working with for the last year uh, in Texas. And uh, Chad, love for you to tell us a little bit about what your experiences are, what you've observed, and then we'll also get into, uh, we want to talk about how we think about how we're managing plant nutrition differently and how we apply that in the field. What are the actual practical applications and what are the outcomes and results that we've observed this last year and what might we expect in the future? So Chad, I'd love to hear a bit about your story and what you've observed. Sure, okay. So um, a lot of you who are on this webinar are familiar with me. I mean, we've grown up together or worked together for a long period of time, but for those of you who don't, I was raised in Yoakum County, which is where a lot of people say is a good place to be from, not necessarily to be at. And so through that experience growing up, growing cotton and looking for ways to improve that system, um, ultimately to try and be more profitable like everyone else. Um, I adopted no-till practices about 20 years ago. That led me into soil health and, and really pursuing understanding what makes a soil function well and, and thereby support the plants that are growing in it well. Um, led me on a journey that, that provided lots of, of information, um, but also raised lots of questions. And um, so through the pursuit of that, uh, that finally culminated in 2018 when I came across uh, some things that John Kemp was publishing, um, who is the founder of Advancing Eco Agriculture. Um, as I listened to some of the material that he had published in webinars and podcasts, I realized that based on his background and understanding of, of plant health and, and just general agronomy and how plants relate to the soil, um, I knew that he had some answers that would be very beneficial for me and people just like me who had been trying to understand these inner relationships for quite some time. And so I reached out to John and the team at AEA and, and started on a journey to learn as much as I could about all of the things that they are well versed in. Um, obviously, um, the region that they come from being in Ohio, um, they were not very familiar with cotton, but after a few conversations, I, I was very confident that based on the understandings that they had of other crops and particularly tree crops, that their understanding of the nutrient relationships and how all of these things worked would be very applicable to cotton. And it would be able to fine tune the things that I had been pursuing for a number of years. And so, that's where we began last year, and then I worked with several producers in the area, uh, implementing those practices and technologies into their operating systems, and we were able to produce some amazing cotton. And so, not necessarily amazing um, in a good cotton year, but based on the fact that we were able to produce comparable results to a good cotton year in a year as bad as 2019 was, uh, speaks volumes to this this understanding of how we actually can manage the plants and particularly the nutrition of the plants to make them healthy so that they can maximize their photosynthetic capacity, which allows them to actually maximize the this growing season that that the plants are getting. So even when that season is very short, um, not only due to the time window, but then also the the cool wet conditions coupled with the extremely hot conditions and all of those things that really shortened our growing window, um, maximizing the, the period of, of growing days that you get is, is very important. And so that's what our, our whole system has been focused on fine tuning, you know, what things to avoid and then what things to spend more time really paying attention to so that we can influence the plants at those critical points of influence to, 
to help produce a high quality um, and an abundant yielding crop. So and that's that's essentially what we did. So our theories were proven to be accurate. Chad, uh, I know that there are many people here from your local area, but also many outside of the area. For those who aren't familiar with what you observed, can you tell us a little bit about what were the results that you saw? We know we manage nutrition a bit differently. What were the outcomes? What did you see this year? Well, the biggest thing that I think will will help people understand where we are in that understanding is that, um, again, with with really poor conditions, we were able to um, produce, you know, 1,850 pound plus cotton in one of our trials that averaged over 56 cents a pound, which compared to what most cotton production did on the high plains, um, that's very significant, not only for yield, but also for quality and combining the two in a, in a less than ideal cotton year was substantial. Um, one of the things that I knew would have a huge impact on that and, and going back to my experiences from, you know, 15 or 18 years ago was that PGRs, plant growth regulators to, to help get a reproductive response from the plant is somewhat effective. And that's what most of us are very common um, in our rhetoric of being able to use. But I had found some research that had indicated that every one of those applications actually costs us four to eight days of growing days based upon what the rate of that application is and what the timing of that application is. And so when we, when we consider that we're generally trying to optimize our growing season and, and particularly in the fall, whether or not we get a good open September to actually turn the fruit that has been put on the plant into mature lint, then it's critical that we don't give up any of those days. And when you consider in, in high production irrigation practices that we might be making, you know, three to four of those applications in a year, pretty simple math, that's costing us, you know, anywhere from 20 to 30 days of our growing season that the plant is actually not metabolizing at all. And then it responds with a reproductive response. And so some of the things that I had come to understand was how the micronutrients actually have energetic responses related to vegetative versus reproductive growth and how we could balance those things particularly well with the sap analysis to actually just give the plant what it needs to reach its genetic potential rather than us trying to manipulate it into maximizing its production. The genetics are there. I mean, we really, the things we've been doing genetically in the last several years to to assist the plants in in being able to withstand disease or insect pressure or all of those kinds of things, um, you know, we're not we really haven't been doing anything to to enhance the genetic capacity that was already in the plant for producing high quality yield. Um, it it's just a matter of giving the plant what it needs and helping it to do what it wants to do, rather than pre pushing it to to get good reproductive. I mean, to get good vegetative growth and then shutting it down so that we can get a reproductive response because we know we have to put fruit on. So essentially, we were able to accomplish that. Four to eight days loss per application of PGR seems to me to be really significant, um, particularly when you is. Does that accumulate with cumulative multiple PGR applications? I, I'm not sure. Um, I, you know, the, the research that I have been exposed to did not go into the detail of whether that was cumulative. I think depending on the rate of application, the plant is able to metabolize that back out. And so, you know, it starts, it starts photosynthesizing at whatever its capacity was likely after it clears that application. But I don't know what the cumulative effect is. We're, we were making those estimates based on each individual impact. So how did you, when you manage nutrition a bit differently this last year, did you use fewer PGR applications? What did you do differently? We actually did not use any PGR applications. And the reason being is that when we set the plant up for success, 
with what we did with an, an in furrow treatment at planting time, we actually gave the plant a good balance of available nutrients to, to balance that reproductive energy with the vegetative energy that we were inherently going to get. And so the plant actually was set up for success so that it didn't try to grow vegetatively very quickly. It actually started fruiting and keeping the internodal spacing pretty tight um, without ever getting into a situation where we actually needed the PGRs. And so in some in some comparisons of you know fields side by side, it was very apparent that the growth, and we have some pictures that we can share of that, that the growth characteristic of the plant was very much like you want to see as a cotton producer where you don't have a really spindly tall plant. You actually have a somewhat of a bush where your internodal spacing is very tight. Your, your fruiting positions within those fruiting branches is very tight. Um, and, you know, and when the plant is doing that, you know, we know that it doesn't really need any PGR application. It's actually doing what it needs to be doing, which is putting fruit on while it's growing. Did that uh, increased tightness in node spacing um, result in any differences in bowl size and number of bowls per plant? Yes, and, and we know that yield is, you know, yield can be quantified somewhat um, in bowl counting by knowing how many locks your bowls have and then obviously how many of those bowls are on the plant. And there's some, there's some pretty good guidelines we have for yield estimation that, that give us, you know, the, the parameters for which bowls need to be counted and, you know, how much that's attributing to the total yield. And so as we see the plant developing that way, and we're getting multiple fruiting positions on those fruiting branches while the plant is growing, then obviously that's very encouraging. Um, the second thing that that's doing is that it's keeping that plant very compact rather than getting long and spindly, which makes harvest um, much more efficient and much more effective. It's, it's able to, we're able to get a lot of the trash and, and stems and sticks out of it when that plant is much more compact. Um, as well as it just it goes through the harvesting equipment much more efficiently. I was just about to ask that question: What happened at harvest, and did you see any? What were the differences in during the harvesting process, if any? Well, one of the one of the reports that I had from one of the growers was that um, you know the man who was operating the harvester said that it was easily, and this was in a where we had treatments side by side, one that that we treated our way. And then, you know, a traditional treatment right beside it where they had, had practiced all of their, their normal practices, including PGRs. Um, you know, one might could argue that they didn't use the PGRs as effectively as they could have. But I think had there been more applications or had they been more diligent in that, it would have created more of a problem, which is what we saw in lots of places here on the High Plains was that traditional practices especially aggressive traditional practices in this growing season actually produce the worst results. And, and we can go into why that is the case for this year and, and help guys understand why those practices all stacked up to work against them this year. But in any event, in that, in that side by side trial, not only was the crop that we had treated ready, um, you know, hard to say exactly, but it, at least, a week to 10 days, maybe two weeks um, earlier maturity in that crop. And so it, it was ready to be harvested earlier. You know, oftentimes during cotton harvesting time, we're getting showers, you know, we're into that time of the year where we're getting part of our annual rainfall and, and that delays harvests anyway. And so, so there was actually a couple of weeks, maybe even, you know, close to three weeks difference between the harvest of those two blocks part of which was due to the maturity. They were not ready to be harvested at the same time. We were well ahead. And then, you know, secondly, we had inclement weather come in and, you know, it, it just didn't work to harvest the, the second one as quickly as it was ready. Um, and so that, that could have, you know, that could have contributed a little bit to the, 
to the quality differences that we saw between those two blocks, but there was no doubt the maturity. We were gaining maturity throughout the entire season, and, and there wasn't any question in looking at the plants that that was true. Our bowls were, you know, were sizing a lot quicker than than the traditional treatment that was right beside us. And then back to what I was saying about the harvester, you know, his testament was that even though we yielded more and our quality was significantly better, our stripping was at least twice as easy to strip as the other, just due to, you know, to how the, the plant was actually positioned such that it had the long branches that were very spindly and, you know, you just can't run the equipment through there as effectively and efficiently as you can a really compact plant that is just full of bowls. And, and particularly that doesn't have trash in the top of the plant. A lot of that late season trash that that's just there through a defoliation or a frost or a, a desiccation, you know, a lot of that, that upper leaf and, and small square and immature bowl trash doesn't go away. And sometimes even with burr extractors on the harvesters, you just, you wind up getting a lot of that to the gin, which contributes not only to some of the quality problems that we had this year, but it also contributes to more trash that the gin is having to separate that's costing you more for what the gin is doing for you. So you're saying we actually had less trash? That's correct. Much less trash. And what do you attribute that to? Was it because the plants were more compact? Did they stop growing sooner? Did they mature and senesce sooner? What were, what were the contributing factors? Both. Um, our plants were actually beginning to senesce before we got the early freeze. And so that was the other contributor to the season being really tough is that we got an October. In most areas, we got an October 11th or October 12th freeze, which is, you know, easily 20 days ahead of our average freeze point. And so um, the plants that were physiologically mature and ready to senesce, because that's what we had been encouraging them to do, they were able to shed a lot of that leaf that was already ready to come off as opposed to the plants that were still in a very vegetative state. Um, you know, early freezes produce that a lot of times. You get when your plant is still very vegetative and it freezes, it's that sticks the leaves and it sticks those small squares and bowls that they don't fall off like they should. And so there's no way to get them off except through the harvesting process. And then they're mixed in with the lint that you really want to be pure. Just for context, Chad, for the people who are not familiar with the local area, you mentioned being a really challenging year, producing 850 pound, 56 cent cotton. What was the context of the regional yield averages? What were most people looking at? Most all of the gins where we were really getting a lot of attention um, because of our grades still being in the 55 to 7, 57 cent range. I know at one gin in particular, um, when, when our cotton was ginned and it was averaging 57 cents, it, it got a lot of attention because the highest grade the gin had seen at that point in time was 52 cents and the average was closer to 45 or 46 cents with a lot of cotton being all the way down in the 30 cent range which that's that's what contributed to a huge number of acreage here on the on the high plains actually being destroyed at harvest time because it was it was not until the crop was ready to be defoliated or have a bowl opener applied to it that that the producers came to realize that the fruit that had been put on was actually not mature and there was nothing there for you know a bowl opening application to even open so that it could be harvested it just wasn't worth harvesting there was very little mature lint in the field and that's where I, I'm saying that all of the things that worked against us, particularly with traditional practices this year, culminated with cotton that was typically high yield in fields that that had the resources they needed to typically produce high yielding cotton was actually destroyed at the end of the season with a you know with a complete season's worth of inputs being put into it and nothing worth harvesting. So that's a you know that's a really really tough situation to be in. For those fields that were harvested, do you have any idea what yields? You mentioned quality, um, the quality parameters. Do you have any idea what yield ranges were like? 
most of the of the treatments that we had ranged i don't there's very little that was below two bales or a thousand pounds on irrigated production and that you know was all the way up to 1850 um quite a bit around the you know right at three bell range which for a lot of growers who are accustomed to growing three bell plus depending on the year you know i i think again that speaks that speaks well to what we were doing was maximizing the plant's capacity because our, our window of opportunity was very, very small. Chad, I'm sure the question that a lot of people have in their mind is what exactly did you do? Uh, what were the tools that you used, the applications that you used, and why did they work? So I'd love to get into that a little bit. What did you sure. do differently from what you've done in the past? Well, traditionally, um, what we've done and, and I'll, I'll kind of outline a, a traditional practice that um, is what we did on my operation previously and what I think a lot of growers are still implementing is, you know, do some soil testing, maybe, maybe not. Seems to be hard to correlate to actually producing consistent changes within our production. So, um, you know, a, a blanket approach to fertility coupled with PGR applications typically starting at a a known place in time being that pinhead square if you have a really rapidly growing plant especially at pinhead squares when you want to start applying your your uh, plant growth regulators to to bring that plant back into check so that it doesn't continue to grow excessively vegetatively um, so we took some of that same um, understanding and applied it to the things that we were doing and so in our preparation for how we approached the year, we knew we wanted to do some things preseason if we could, unfortunately, based on when I got started with um, advancing eco agriculture and just the availability to get those things in order, we were not able to treat prior to planting with a soil inoculant and a stimulant to actually get the microbes working for us. But we did that at planting time with an in furrow treatment in most circumstances um, doesn't have to be in furrow but i think that's where we saw the greatest results and the and the greatest efficiency usage but we essentially made that application at planting time to set the plant up for success to basically give that seedling some of the things that we knew that it was going to need in order to have some reproductive energy while it was growing vegetatively and then um, we knew we were going to make an application at Pinhead Square to essentially address some of those other micronutrients that have a, a large impact on reproductive growth. So that's what that's what our plan was going in. And part of that is what we did. The, the real big key that we added to that was a plant sap analysis, which I became familiar with after working with advancing eco agriculture where we could actually take somewhat of a blood test via looking at the leaves and the actual sap that is within those leaves telling us what the plant is actually metabolizing we were able to address those micronutrient deficiencies with foliar applications so instead of using a pgr we were actually applying the micronutrients that the plant was telling us it was not metabolizing or it, it did not have the capacity to move around within the plant because they were either not available to the soil or, I mean, they were not available in the soil to the plant or they had been tied up. And so we addressed those micronutrient deficiencies based on what we were seeing in our plant sap analysis to balance those nutrients. Um, again, to support that plant's inherent ability to put fruit on while it's growing vegetatively. Chad, how many applications did you make compared to the historical PGR applications? Um, some fields, in, in fact, even on this field that, that we had the greatest results, uh, we only made two applications of, you know, of this nutrient balancing solution that, that we put together. Um, some fields had as much as three. I don't, I don't recall any fields that had more than three. Um, but it, it was all, you know, just based on timing. Um, we were not even able to make those applications as early in the season as we wanted to and, and which would have been much more beneficial just due to the, 
the season that we had. Everything was delayed in planting. We were at least 20 days behind having plants that were large enough to actually take the leaf samples that we needed for the plant sap analysis. And so everything just stacked up to being delayed. And then, you know, we didn't, so we, we didn't make very many applications. I, I think if we had a typical year, we would be looking at three applications as a rule, um, you know, possibly four, if we had a really, you know, a really good growing season. Considering the addition of these foliar applications, did you manage other nutrients any differently? How did you manage nitrogen? Were you looking at similar nitrogen application rates as what you had in the past? No, we actually recommended uh, to cut the nitrogen rate up front um, in in half. And, and actually, um, on a lot of these fields, we wound up not applying any more nitrogen. And so that was one of the other things we were we were considering that we wanted to prove was that we're we're way over applying nitrogen and and it's not actually helping us to yield it's actually contributing to more of the stress that that plant is dealing with as it's trying to metabolize the things that that are available to it and so um, we know that we're getting a lot of growth energy from calcium and I know you and I have discussed the potential of you know what these cotton plants are capable of because of the because of the effective way that they can uptake calcium from these very high calcareous soils that we have, um, it, it's actually, I think we're gonna be able to fine tune that and even make much more progress on that um, as we continue to look at saps. But essentially we were recommending, you know, don't put out any nitrogen early season, let's wait and see what the plant tells us. And there was very little circumstances that we saw where we actually did need to contribute a little bit of nitrogen through the growing season and that was very little um and but we were gauging you know we weren't guessing at what that, that was going to be we were actually gauging that via the plant sap analysis telling us what the plant actually had available in it and and obviously if the plant's not growing well but we can look at what the nitrate level and the total nitrogen level in the plant is and it doesn't need more nitrogen, then putting more nitrogen on it is not going to help it get the growth that we want. That's actually not our limiting factor. And so we, we did see a lot of that. Um, and certainly we are, are prepared to make recommendations this year based on our experiences from that last year. I think the key point that I'd like to point out here is that we're familiar with the idea of plants growing very rapidly from the addition of a lot of nitrogen. We add nitrogen, we get very rapid vegetative growth. I think a point that has been missed is that calcium can do that exact same thing. We can get the same speed of growth and the same volume of biomass, the same amount of time with calcium as we do with nitrogen. But there's one distinct difference. And the difference is that when you produce that volume and that speed of growth with calcium, you get this very tight node spacing instead of having very widely spaced internodes, you get nodes that are a couple of inches apart. So I think you already have soils in your region that have an abundance of calcium and limiting some of that nitrogen gives us, and, and getting more of the growth energy from calcium gives us the same speed of vegetative growth and it gives us a high quality growth at the same time. And it seems to me this is so important in light of the comments that you made about PGRs. If you're really losing four to eight days with each PGR application, then the idea of applying such large quantities of nitrogen and also applying PGRs at the same time just seems like an oxymoron to me. It's like driving with your foot on the accelerator and the brake at the same time. You're driving, you, the, the nitrogen is the accelerator and the PGR is the brake. Why would you do both of those things at the same time? Right. And, and I, I can attest to being a young man and seeing when <laughs> irrigated cotton was, you know, remotely successful. The, the only people that were really having success growing irrigated cotton in the early 80s were very limited irrigation because if they really irrigated well, they got a very growthy plant, um, you know, and of course we had, you know, nitrogen and lots of other things in that equation also, but, but until people really used how, learned how to use the plant growth regulators, 
you couldn't produce high yielding cotton because all you got was a big tall plant with very little fruit and so i think that's that's the reason that has become such a well accepted practice is that you know most growers experiences are that when the plant is really growthy if you don't put it back into check or get it back in check by applying these plant growth regulators you wind up with you know a very low yielding crop and even low quality crop because the plant is spending so much time vegetatively that it's not producing you know mature fruit and so I, I agree with you that that always troubled me and that's some of the work that I began doing 15 years ago was how can we biologically stimulate the plant to put on some fruit while it's growing rather than you know having one foot on the gas and one foot on the brake and uh and thinking that that's not only thinking that that's going to work well, but all of those things are costing us money. Uh, you know, I mean, we're, we're buying all of those in addition to the application that it, that it's requiring to get that done and the timing of that application. And oftentimes you miss those windows due to inclement weather. You know, a lot of times what really contributes to a plant growing excessively vegetatively is, you know, is having a good window of, of metabolic activity you know good photosynthesis and then we get a rain and then we get some cool wet weather and then maybe we're not able to get into the field and that plant just takes off growing vegetatively and we can't even get in the field to do anything about it and then we beat ourselves up the whole rest of the season even through harvest because we weren't able to get in the field to apply the plant growth regulator instead of you know approaching that equation completely differently which is what we're doing, understanding that that we're getting a lot of great growth energy from that calcium, which is free. I mean, in our soils, we don't need calcium. We just need to make the calcium available to the plant. And that's what we saw with our saps was that the further we got into the season, the more calcium we had available in the plant, and which, you know, I think was a clear indication of that plant, that cotton plant, based on its symbiosis with the microbes that it's working with in that soil, it apparently has a very, very effective way of releasing that calcium and getting it into the plant. And that's what makes the, the cotton plant very resilient in our climatology is that it has such an excessive level of calcium that it has very thick, tough leaves and, and it allows it to withstand these harsh conditions that some people wonder why the settlers ever stopped here instead of getting on to somewhere that was actually productive. But, you know, nonetheless, considering all of those things, there, there were just a lot of pieces of that equation that all of my life, it, it never made sense. The more I learned, the more questions I had about, why are we doing that? That just, you know, it seems counterintuitive or, you know, as you described, um, doesn't really make much sense that that's the way that we're approaching it. And then everything in that equation has to be perfect or it doesn't work out as opposed to, you know, balancing these nutrient levels, getting the plant set up to, to capture, you know, all of the things that it needs. And then we don't have to be in a crisis over not getting into the plant at, at the right time. I, you know, it's, it's doing what it needs to do. I think that's something that we have observed and experienced in all of our work at advancing eco agriculture with a wide range of different crops is that, when you have an ideal year, when you have a perfect year, which seems to be becoming more and more rare, it doesn't happen very often, this this uh, different approach to nutrition um, may not produce a significantly different response in terms of yield and quality. We might get a 5% bump or a 3% bump. Um, sometimes it's almost the same. Sometimes it's a bit more. But then when you have those challenged years, uh, when you have drought stress or when you have uh, heat or cold or wet or dry, almost any any extreme weather conditions, it's in those conditions when these crops, when we manage nutrition differently, have a completely different outcome and they excel. And that's when we get the types of results that you're describing. In Briefly in passing, you mentioned the economics that calcium, the calcium application is free and doesn't cost us anything. Uh, what have been the economics of managing nutrition differently this past year um, with the additional foliar applications, reduced nitrogen? What was the what was the comparative cost per acre of managing in this way versus 
the treated controls? Well, the the nutritional treatments that we made um, were averaging probably from twelve to sixteen or eighteen dollars per treatment, depending on you know what other macronutrients might have needed to be included, which was more expensive than than a typical PGR application. If if you know if the plant growth regulator is virtually all that we're applying, um, but one of the big keys there is that you know managing the crop this way we are actually able to save a lot of resources that we've been spending on macronutrients particularly um, nitrogen phosphorus and potassium applications that are actually not only not beneficial in a lot of circumstances they're actually detrimental to what we're trying to do because of the stresses that they're creating in addition to you know, we we validated with plant sap analysis um, in 2019 that a lot of our preseason phosphorus application never shows up in the plant. And so when we consider that we're managing more for the crop that is actually growing and what that crop is telling us that it needs, um, it's they're very cost effective treatments compared to these rules of thumb practices that we've been doing that's actually not only throwing our money away, it's actually contributing to our problem. You just mentioned phosphorus and not seeing phosphorus absorption. What have you observed this last year with phosphorus and potassium applications? You mentioned cutting nitrogen in half. Are you doing something similar with PNK? How are you expecting to manage phosphorus and potassium differently going forward? Well, what we saw last year was that um, in one of these fields, particularly where where we had a pre-plant phosphorus application, the plants were still showing phosphorus deficiency as soon as we started taking our saps. And so we thought, well, you know, maybe we'll, maybe we'll pick that phosphorus up later, but in the meantime, let's go ahead and address that either with a foliar application or a side dress, depending on, you know, on what, what the man's operation was and how he was set up to do it. And what we found out was that we actually carried the phosphorus needs through the whole season on about seven dollars worth of phosphorus and so when when we consider what we have traditionally been applying and and again i know that the science and the support for you know what we have traditionally been doing is based on a a mining um, equation that is not very accurate at best and maybe somewhat even deceptive at worst um, but it moves a lot of products and and it helps lots of suppliers um, you know be profitable, but it it's not helping the grower be profitable. And so um, i I believe that as we continue to practice the regenerative things that we are and we continue to improve the symbiosis between the plants and the microbes and how those microbes are actually working for us in that soil to make those nutrients available. Uh, oftentimes, you know, we don't have a we don't have a deficiency in the soil that needs to be addressed with a soil application. We have a deficiency in the plant because the plant is not able to uptake what is in the soil because the microbes are so inactive that they're not you know they're not making that nutrient available to the plant or some of the other things that we have done, you know, with starter fertilizers and other things that that we think are contributing to the, you know, the success of the plant are actually a very quick hit, if you will. You know, we get a little bit of growth response, but then it's actually contributing to the demise of the system throughout the the course of the year because we're encouraging the plant not to have that symbiotic relationship with all of the microbes and with the things that are functioning in the soil to make those nutrients available. And so, so yes, I recommend yeah. that are, don't apply, you know, the, the rule of thumb stuff, you know, let's at least reduce that significantly. And then depending on what our capacity is to apply those nutrients via, you know, fertigation or side dress or top dress or, you know, foliar, then, you know, we can make adjustments based on how easy we can catch up if we see that we're behind. But actually what we're mostly seeing is that we're not really behind. It's just the plant that's deficient 
And if we don't address that deficiency, then, you know, we're never giving the plant an opportunity to photosynthesize efficiently. Chad, I know you mentioned you had some photos that you'd like to share, and I would love for you to pull those up and talk a little bit about um, what you observed and what you were seeing in the field. So most, uh, most cotton producers that are, that are on this webinar are, you know, are going to be familiar with what a good patch of cotton looks like. Um, and so again, this is this is a good patch of cotton. You can see lots of open bowls. Um, you can see that as you look out across that, you're not seeing a lot of that trash in the top of the plant that I was describing, which doesn't contribute to anything except ginning cost and and grade deficits. But um, you know what's what's really significant here is is not how amazing this crop is but how amazing this crop is based on, you know, the season that we had, because I did not see any cotton on the high plains that was open like this cotton was, that was, you know, ready to be harvested. Um, you know, that, that the freeze didn't really contribute to lots of problems, you know, even in some of our treatments where we did not excel as much as we anticipated that we would, it was due to, you know, staining or leaf trash due to the inclement weather and the early freeze that we got that contributed to the grades being a little lower than expected. They were still far above the averages in the area, but they were not as good as a typical year just due to the circumstances that were beyond, you know, what we could control. Um, one of the other real serious contributors was stand counts. You know, we just, we just did not most of the early planted stuff you know just we just didn't get a good stand because of the conditions that we had either either soil conditions at planting due to the limited window that everybody had to try to get in there and get it done and you know conditions weren't optimum then it was cool and wet again I mean a lot of things contributed to not getting good stands and what you did have you know didn't have a lot of opportunities to flourish and so this was this was the field that um, that yielded, you know, a little over 1,850 pounds and graded 56 cents, which, you know, most, most producers can look at that and believe that, yeah, that's, that's certainly possible because of how open that field is. And, and obviously you can see on 40 inch rows that, that the middles are being lapped. These plants are not very tall. Um, this is, I think this is a picture of me in one of those fields. Um, you can see that here the picture on the right is actually not one of our treatments. You can see the growth characteristic there in the top of that plant. This is the, the field that's right beside it um, where we were comparing our treatments that these plants were big and lush, lapping the middles, but you can also see that they're growing vegetatively out the top. They don't have that, that nice characteristic that we're looking for. More like these plants that were in another field um, where that, you know, the, the plant is very short and blocky, um, which means that it, it's putting on fruiting nodes. It's not just, you know, it's not just growing vegetatively. So that's really all the pictures that I have. Again, I, you know, most people know what a good cotton field looks like, but the fact that we could produce one um, in these tough conditions, I think is a testament to to how well this program is going to work and the opportunities that it provides us not only for managing these crops that we're accustomed to, but I think it also opens up the door for considering longer season varieties and maybe even Pima cotton, which is, you know, one of the other things that I'm going to be working with in the coming year is some long staple cotton that needs a long growing season that is typically pushing our window of opportunity, but I think um, considering what we can do nutritionally to maximize that photosynthetic capacity and again, maximize the genetic potential that's already in that plant, then I think we can see some successes with some other um, types of cotton that will be not only, you know, a, a great fit for these high plains growers, but, you know, a very profitable opportunity as well. That is something worth mentioning. Um, Chad is how how are we able to get the plants to senesce earlier, and um, this is actually something we've done a lot of work on with our various fruit and vegetable crops that we've worked on. 
And we've learned that it is possible to manage nutrition in a manner to speed up uh, senescence and and um, have proper senescence and ripening occur earlier, or we can delay it and have it occur much later, depending exclusively on how we manage nutrients. And so I think this is, uh, of course, if you want to manage nutrients with that level of focus and uh, be able to know exactly what's happening, what's going on, you need to measure it, you need to know. And this is where you've been working with SAP analysis. Uh, there's a question that's come through here on this topic from uh, Hunter Wild. Where are you sending your SAP samples? How do you decide which nutrients you will need to apply to support reproductive growth? So um, Advancing Eco Agriculture works with crop health labs out of Ohio. Um, and ultimately the SAPs based on the history are being analyzed in, at a lab um, in the Netherlands. And so we were, we were actually coordinating those SAP tests being pulled here. I mean, all of the growers that were working with our program were pulling those samples of leaves and they were getting those to me. And then I was coordinating the sample straight to the Netherlands because we could save a little time that way. Uh, and oddly enough, I know the, the biggest question, which is one of the questions that I had when I, when I understood what that process was going to look like, was how in the world are we going to send lab samples to the Netherlands and get useful information in a timely manner? And I was amazed that we could, um, for, <laughs> for a very economical cost even, uh, we were able to pull, in, in some instances, we were able to pull the saps on monday and have results by friday of that week and and easily we would have the results back by monday of the following week and so then we would we would analyze those um those reports based on what those nutrients were actually telling us that that plant was needing actually it's it's you have to have an understanding of how a lot of these nutrients work within the plant and regarding which ones can be mobilized within the plant, which ones can only be pulled into the plant from the soil or via a foliar application. Um, but if you understand all of those things, like John Kemp and the team at AEA does, then you can actually draw some really good equations based on what the plant is telling you it's needing by the way that it's moving those nutrients around or by the nutrients that are actually deficient. Then we put together a blend of those nutrients based on the products that I have in my warehouse and we went and applied that blend. Yep. And uh, to, to chime in on the, the second part of your question, Hunter, um, I think one of the, well, I don't think I know that one of the keys to our success as a company at uh, Advancing Eco Agriculture is that we don't guess about anything that it's possible to measure. And um, so we don't guess which nutrients that we need to apply. We measure it with a SAP analysis. And then with that also, um, we partner that with our understanding of the impact that different nutrients have on the plant. This is obviously a very big topic, more than we can get into in a few minutes. Um, I actually have a a uh, podcast episode that I recorded on vegetative versus reproductive nutrients. It's one of the most popular episodes ever. And um, you can find that um, on the podcast at regenerativeagriculturepodcast.com. But just to give you the, the bullet point overview, very quickly, very simply, there are four nutrients which cause plants to grow vegetatively very rapidly. If you're familiar with one, it's nitrogen. Second is potassium. Third is chloride, and fourth is calcium. Chloride is not commonly considered to be a nutrient, but we do have to consider it when we think about this vegetative growth energy, particularly in the context where many potassium applications are often potassium chloride. So potassium chloride and nitrogen applications, myriad of potash, will give us this very rapid vegetative growth, which gives us long internodes and smaller size bowls and fewer bowls. Uh, and so then so there's those four nutrients, and I'll come back to those four to speak about calcium. Then all the others, um, phosphorus, uh, sulfur, magnesium, manganese, etc., all the other nutrients drive reproductive growth. They trigger bud initiation, and when they are present in abundant supply, they produce shorter internodes and cytokine and dominance within the plant. 
the most effective reproductive nutrients that can slow a plant down, you can almost use them as a growth regulator, are manganese and phosphorus. You can almost use manganese and phosphorus as a growth regulator because when you apply them as a foliar or you make certain that the plant has an abundant supply, it will slow down vegetative growth and give you very strong reproduction. But there's another nutrient, the, going back to the vegetative nutrients, calcium is different from the other three nutrients that drive vegetative growth because <coughs> potassium, chloride, and nitrogen all have a symbiotic relationship with the hormone auxin. So when you have auxin dominance, you get this very rapid shoot growth, very rapid vegetative growth, and widely spaced nodes. So calcium is also a vegetative nutrient, and it drives rapid growth, but it has a symbiotic relationship with cytokinin instead of with auxin. It means you get the same speed of growth, the same volume of growth, but now you get nodes that are spaced three inches apart or perhaps four inches apart instead of six or eight. So you get the same speed of growth, but tightly spaced nodes. Bottom line is that in order to um, get the same speed and quantity of growth with higher quality and tightly spaced nodes, we particularly emphasize more calcium, less nitrogen, and an abundance of manganese and phosphorus. And there's other details that tie into that as well, but that's kind of the um, three or four minute, very rapid fire overview of how we think about managing those nutrients. One question that actually does come to mind, uh, you mentioned bowl size a little bit and uh, number of locks. Do you observe any differences in increased number of locks and bowl size? Because I know that's one of the things that managing these reproductive nutrients also influences is the size of the fruit or the grain or of whatever crop we're working with. Yeah, so a lot of these plants, um, you know, a five lock bowl is what we would call a a normal bowl when the plant has what it needs, um, a four lock bowl, or even sometimes you'll see a three lock bowl, which is, you know, that's the plant is attempting to reproduce, but it just doesn't have the energy that it needs for that. You know, it's lacking something. And so, um, you know, a lot of times when we're having stressful weather, um, you know, we'll see a lot of four lock bowls. And so, uh, you know, I didn't do a lot of bowl counting last season just to see what the percentages were of you know of one versus the other but um but obviously that's not something that we really have to manage for as opposed to managing for giving the plant what it needs addressing its deficiencies and letting the plant do what the plant wants to do which is the plant's going to put on five lock bowls if it has the nutrition that it needs and it's not limited in its capacity to do that Thanks, Chad. There's another question that has come through from uh, James Johnson. Um, how does the role of Roundup and the potential for it to chelate manganese fit into this equation? This is an awesome question. Um, <laughs> I don't speak widely and broadly about the challenges of glyphosate and Roundup just because I believe it's much more powerful to be for something than to be against something. But I think anyone who has looked at the science with an open mind, quickly realizes that glyphosate is a very significant challenge. And so in the cases where we um, haven't yet figured out how to not use it and are still using it, we simply need to, there, there's two points. One is it is possible by managing the sprayer solution using structured water and, and different types of water treatment devices to reduce the application rates of glyphosate very significantly and get the same or better uh, weed control. That's definitely an avenue that I think we need to pursue. But then secondly, if we are in a situation where we are still applying Roundup, then we need to counteract that and we need to be aware that it is most certainly chelating manganese and iron and cobalt and copper in the soil profile. And um, we are going to need to address that with additional foliar applications or by whatever mechanism. We need to make sure that the plant is not deficient as a result of the applications that we've put on. It's a great question. Uh, then there's another question that has come through from Travis. Hi, Travis. Does glyphosinate have the same chelation, as effect, same chelation effect as glyphosate? Um, 
Yes, it does, but not to the same degree and not to the same strength. Um, so when you look at the chelation constants, um, glyphosinate, I used to know this right off the top of my head, and now it's fading for me a little bit. I think glyphosinate uh, is primarily attracted to cobalt and then copper, if I recall it correctly, uh, whereas glyphosate um, is principally attracted to, uh, also to cobalt, but then to manganese and zinc and iron, and copper is a little bit further down on the list. Um, so it is also a very strong chelator, but it has um, an attraction to different trace minerals that we need to manage a little bit differently. All right, I want to thank all of you for attending. I hope you found the information useful and valuable. If you have any follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to Chad. Uh, I'm sure many of you have his number and his contact information. If not, uh, reach out to us and the team here at Advancing Eco Agriculture. And also um, feel free to look at the many recordings that we have on YouTube um, and on our podcast. Um, and we'll also be sharing this recording on YouTube as well. You can share with your friends and colleagues and other people who may be interested as well and learning more about what we're doing. One more thing I want to remind everyone of, there is a No-Till Texas Soil Health Conference coming up in February in Lubbock at the Overton. Uh, you can find out about that at notilltexas.com, I think. Um, anyway, um, we were trying to get John to be a speaker at that event, and we were not able to get that done, but he did find time in his schedule to be here the following day. So that conference is the 11th and 12th of February, and we have John booked to be here on the 13th for a somewhat intimate um, get together to really dive into this question and answer really, you know, really dig into the mechanics of, of soil health and how it contributes to plant health and how the best way to achieve that is. And so for any of those of you who have found this information um, intriguing or helpful and you would like to dig a little deeper, then reach out to me and I'll see if we can get you booked into that um, that one day intensive that John will be here in person in Lubbock on the 13th of February. And so again, it is limited spacing. So, um, you know, reach out to me and let me know if you would really like to participate and we'll see if we can find enough seats for everyone. That's perfect. Thank you for catching that, Chad. I'm looking forward to being there. It's gonna be a great day. Yes. Thanks. All right. Thanks everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Chad. Talk to you soon. Thank you.